Thank you. Um, thank you for coming tonight. I mean, it's there is some restrictions and, and everything that's going on right now. So we're a small group, and but uh, it's always to ha good to have someone to talk to at the very least. So thank you for coming. And we have people on YouTube as well that's uh, watching live. So uh, hopefully you will learn quite a lot and it will be interesting. Um, and I don't know how many of you are actually sort of developing. You're a developer, most, all of you, mostly, because this is quite quite technical, although it's not super technical, but, but uh, we'll actually try to fit this into when you write code a little bit. Um, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm going to present you a scenario here, because I'm going to use the scenario throughout the whole, just to build onto uh, this uh, secure communication uh, using those building blocks that we have available. So I'm going to introduce you to Alice and Bob, and a little bit about myself as well. I'll start with Alice and Bob, and I, I, I randomly picked two images while searching for Alice and Bob, so this is the result. I think you might recognize them, and we're going to use these two, so they're, they're on my assistant. Uh, and the scenario here is actually that they're going to be talking uh, over a public network. And usually this is the internet. Uh, and one thing that I have done here, just uh, to remove a certain aspect, is that you, normally you would use HTTPS here, so TLS or something like that to do communication. I remove that here because in a sense that is cheating, because we're gonna learn a little bit how you actually secure this communication without that. But a little bit off. Is that better there? That's great. So uh, now you all that uh, you joining from YouTube could turn up the volume a little bit or something. So um, okay, so I removed HTTPS, and uh, so we're gonna learn the basics. HTTPS is good, but there are some tra uh, pitfalls there as well. So so by just blindly trusting it, you might actually open up for for certain vulnerabilities. So that's the assumption, and these two I wanna communicate securely uh, with each other. Uh, so Alice here wants to uh, send a message to Bob. And basically, in this case, Alice just wants to remind Bob that he needs to buy milk on his way home. So that's our premise, really. But now, since this is over an insecure public network, this message here is, is not protected. So. You could place someone else in between here, and in this case I'm placing myself. Uh, and I can of course also read this message coming in. And if I'm really uh, on a sort of a malicious mood, I could change the message to something else, and Bob wouldn't actually know. So this is a random message, has nothing to do with this image over here or anything, but, but I could change it. Uh, so this is what we're going to be working with. Uh, and I'm just going to introduce myself a little bit as well before we start. Uh, so my name is Niklas Schelin, and I work at a company called Softhouse, which is actually just a couple of floors up in this building where we're at. Uh, and I work with security uh, as a consultant, helping companies actually improving the security on many different levels in the organization. So it's not just in development, it's higher up in the organization because it's important that you have a common understanding of uh, security throughout the organization. But I am a developer in the background, so this is really sort of my area where I uh, thrive the best. But enough about me because I'm not the interesting thing here uh, today. Uh, I'm going to go through a couple of basic in theory just first to sort of place ourselves on the same level when it comes to information security. So there is a few uh, properties that are normally referred to when you talk about data protection. Uh, and the first one is really confidentiality. And that is really where you protect data from someone else that shouldn't be able to see it. And encryption is normally what you would use in that, that regards. Uh, second one is integrity, and that is protecting the data from being modified. So if, if the data changes, you can actually see that. 
So it doesn't, it doesn't protect from confidentiality, but it checks the modification of the data. And the third one is availability. And this is a very broad topic, uh, but it's, it's basically about making information available for authorized people when they need it. So all these three together kind of builds this data protection around it. And this is known as the CIA triad, which has really nothing to do with the intelligence agency, but just happen to have the same sort of letters. There are other models uh, and there are other properties that you can add to this, but these are the basic three ones that are usually refer to. Uh, if you feel I'm standing in your way, you can just let me know. Uh, so we're going to start with integrity. So again, this is where we detect that data has been modified. And I'm going to introduce, you probably know it already, but uh, something called hashing. So you would take a message, in this case it's by milk, you run it through an algorithm and you get this sort of result. So this is called a hashing algorithm. There are many different ones, but we're going to look at the cryptographic ones. Uh, I'm going to soon explain exactly what that means. But, but this here, it kind of a random looking uh, result, which is always going to be the result from this message. And that's a very important part. So the definition of a cryptographic hash is that it needs to be efficient. It needs to be quick. Uh, and that is a very good thing because then it's cheap to use. And we need to use it quite a lot. Uh, it's deterministic, meaning that any uh, input material uh, always produces the same result, uh, which also is, uh, is something that is very important so we can actually use it to compare data that, that we know nothing about, for example. It needs to appear random. So this result that, that is produced, if we change just a tiny little bit on it, it needs to produce a result that looks completely different. There should be no real relationship between the initial result and that little modification that we did. And one way. So if we get this one of the random looking input, uh, outputs, then we shouldn't be able to find what that input was. So, uh, and the final one, which is uh, uh, very, very important in our case and really sort of defines that cryptographic side, is that it's resistant to, to collisions. So it should be very, very hard to find two inputs that produce the same result. Uh, and, and, as, uh, and this is quite difficult. And if you, uh, as a question here, how many people do you think needs to be in the same place at the same time for there to be a 50% chance that they share the same birthday? There's a guy who knows the answer. So that's 23 is the answer, and that's not so many. So you think about it, that's your average school class. Uh, so it, about 50% of all Swedish schools in, in the classes there, there are two pu pupils that are not twins that share the same birthday. Uh, and you don't get to answer this next one. How, how, how many do you think to, there need to be in one room for there to be a 99.9% .9 chance for the same thing, to share the same birthday. Any guesses? So almost for sure. It, c it could be, but it's a, it turns out there's only 70 people. So if you have your link, LinkedIn account and you probably have more than 70 connections, there is a very good chance that at one, one of the days during the year, you will see in your notification field two birthdays. Uh, so it, it, collisions happens all the time, and this is actually called the birthday problem. Uh, and that is something that a cryptographic hash algorithm needs to be really re resistant uh, from. And there are many different algorithms, and here's a list of uh, a few of them. Uh, I'm not going to go through them uh, so much, but I'm just going to say that there are a couple that should never be used, and that's the MD5 and the SHA-1. Uh, they are broken. They don't protect so well from this birthday problem, so to speak. Uh, the easiest choice for anyone that don't want to learn more or be sort of uh, do some research is SHA-2 and SHA-3. SHA-2 is the one that you usually uh, know as SHA-256 or SHA-512 or something like that. But they're actually standards. 
So all the SHA ones are standards, whereas the first one is, is broken and shouldn't be used. It could be used in legacy system and you have to do it, but if, you can, if you're doing something new, choose either of SHA 2 or 3. Now SHA 3 is very new uh, and it might not be as widely adopted, so SHA 2 is a fairly safe choice. Broken in the sense, if, if we take MD5, for example, uh, it's, it's actually very trivial to find an input that produces the same output as something else. Uh, you can actually, there are uh, projects on GitHub that you can download and do this for you. So let's assume that you're actually protecting your password in a database with a SHA-5 uh, hash. And if I know that hash, I know what I'm supposed to generate, but I don't know your password, I can easily find another data set that produces the same hash of that password, which meaning I can log into your account without your password, potentially. Uh, so, so, so never use these unless it's legacy, basically. Um, but we're gonna use this in the context of digital signatures. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit but the difference here, so just going back to that example where we're hashing a uh, buy milk message. So we get this output here, which is what Bob will receive. He'll receive these two things. And of course, if I were to change that message, I could produce my message and I can produce a hash of that. So there's no way for Bob here to realize that buy milk was the original message. So hashes straight up can't be used as digital signatures. We need to do something else. And what we, what we need to do, or Alice in this case, is that he has to generate some secret something. Uh, that could be anything really, but, but normally you would just random data of some sort. This has to be shared though, so Bob needs to have that. And that's a problem we're gonna get to uh, later on. But for now, just assume that Bob has this key as well. So what Alice does is it takes this buy milk message, he adds in this key, that could be a simple concatenation between two strings or something, produces a new hash from it, and then he sends the, the message and the hash to Bob. Bob already has this key, so you can recreate uh, this signature from this message, knowing that it is still the same message that Bob sent. Uh, although there is one slight problem with it, a potential problem depending on your, what your application does uh, and your needs, and that is really that this digital signature is always valid. No matter if it was generated one year ago or yesterday or just now, it's still the same signature from that same message and that shared key. So if I were to place myself in the middle, steal that message, I could sort of replay that message to Bob any number of times, and when he verifies it, he'll see, yes, it's a message from Alice, it's fine. And he'll go off and buy all the milk in the store. Uh, so what you could do, depending if you need to or not, is that you would add in time to this. So in the same way that you're producing a, this shared secret key, you would add in time as well. And then you produce another result. Then when Bob gets this message, he can verify it the same way that, that we just seen. And he'll see it, it's valid, but he also verifies the time within all this and he sees, okay, it's still valid, but it was done two months ago, so maybe I shouldn't trust it. Uh, there are many different ways of adding time, uh, but you could just as well just add time into this message part here in, in string con concatenation or something else important thing is to verify it uh, when you receive it. So we're gonna revisit this scenario. No, sorry, not yet. Very, very soon we're gonna revisit the scenario. So a little practical example here, how to use this. So there is such a thing called the HMAC and that's the hash-based message authentication code. Uh, this is a, a very common function that you use to produce digital signatures. In the back it's using ha hashing functions as we just seen but it kind of packages up and cr uh, produces signatures from it. And this takes, most of the time, three parameters. Uh, the first one is really that message. That's your data that you want to 
uh, create the signature from. So that would be buy milk in our uh, example here. If you're using time, then potentially that's where time would go in as well. Uh, the second parameter here is something that you pull out from your magic hat. And this magic hat is very important because that's a secure random generator. There are many different uh, 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 random generators, but this needs to be secure. Um, and in Java, it's called secure random and it's called different things in different platforms. Just make sure that it's a secure random generator. And the third one here is basically which hashing algorithm do you want to use? And we, we had no sort of uh, pre-knowledge of which one is the best one. These are the easy choices. SHA-2 Shaw, Shaw or SHA-3. Uh, sometimes it matters the size that it outputs, which is the, the number following it. Sometimes it doesn't matter. Uh, SHA-256 is probably good enough for most cases. This would do something called a tag. And a tag is a digital signature. That's the signature. Uh, and you need to put those all things together and send that over to who's ever receiving it. So depending on your application, how you're using it, normally you stick the tag at the end. And if you're using time, maybe that goes in there, maybe we don't. Uh, because you could also agree on the time and have that as a sort of out of band parameter uh, that you can verify. But the message goes in there, of course, and this is what you send, and this is what Bob can verify. So now, if we revisit this scenario, Alice wants to send his buy milk message, so he will run this through an hashing algorithm, which is using also that shared key that they had. And of course, on the other side, Bob can verify that this is really a message sent by Alice because he will verify with that uh, key that only they share. But we haven't really solved the problem yet though. So, okay, so if I put myself here in the middle, I can read this message, but I can't change it because I don't have this key. But I can still read it, which means that I could actually just go off to the store and buy all the milk and that essentially creates a denial of service towards Bob. Uh, so, so I can still read that confidential message. And that's our next sort of topic to look at. How do we protect that part? So confidentiality is when we protect messages to be read by someone who shouldn't supposed to re uh, read them. Symmetric encryption is the most common encryption method. That is where you have the same key to encrypt as you have when you decrypt. It's a 2,000 years old uh, encryption method, basically. We have modern algorithms today, uh, but it's the same principle, really. Uh, sh it normally called also shared key encryption or secret key encryption. And there are plenty of different ones, and here's a few sort of listed. Again, I'm not going to go through them. I'll just say that if you don't know which one to use, use the advanced encryption standard, AES. That's a standard that's been approved, verified, and tried and tested for many, many years, and is good enough for the American military, so it's probably good enough for your application as well. Some of these others are good, some are, are, of them might be broken as well, uh, so if you don't know what you're looking for, use AES, it will work. Uh, but it has one little problem with it. It's not a problem, it's just something that you need to be aware of. And here are many mistakes. Uh, many, many apps released on Android has turned out to use this wrongly. And this is a very important fact. It works with something called uh, a block cipher mode. And common block cipher modes are these here. And, uh, and usually, mo most people don't know what they do. And I'm not going to go into detail what they do, but they're basically an instruction set for the algorithm, how it's going to use every block when it encrypts, uh, how it should encrypt it, and how they relate. Uh, so this is actually a very important uh, choice to do when you're encrypting. Because if you grab a random image of the net, 
just happened to be Tux the pe penguin in this case. You have some sort of encryption key, you encrypt this image and you would expect this result, which is looking fairly random. And that's really the point of encryption that all outputs should be as close to random as possible. Now, if you use this wrongly, which is fairly easy to do, you might get a result that you don't expect. So this image here is actually an encrypted version of this, uh, of this Tux the Penguin, but as you can see, there are some similarities between these. And it probably is not the result you, you expected when encrypting data. This is using something called electronic codebook mode. Uh, and that is, that is there, probably for legacy purpose, I don't know why they still keep it, but they should probably remove it, but it should never be used. Uh, this up here is the CBC mode, which is better, which is the uh, cipher block chaining mode. So, in a sense, never use the first one, ever, just forget it exists. Uh, the other ones are probably good, but you need to know what they're doing and what purpose they, they, they serve. So, as an easy choice, it's either the C CBC mode or the GCM mode. I'm going to go through the details on how they work. Uh, but yes, that's, that's the very important thing, is never to use the first one. It's a very common mistake. So, uh, so if we look how we're going to use this in a development sort of environment, so we assume we have a method called AES-CBC. So that's AES encryption using cipher block cha uh, chaining mode. Sometimes the mode is actually a parameter as well, but that really depends on the implementation and so forth. So it takes three parameters uh, as a standard or a minimum level, basically. The first one is called an initialization vector, an IV. And this is, this is a very important parameter. Um, but it's a, usually a random value, or should be a random value, 128 bits. Uh, it's not actually sensitive, so you can send it off however you like. You just need it when you decrypt later on. Uh, but it should never re be reused. Uh, so if you're encrypting the same data with the same key a second time, you use a new, new IV. And the reason for that is a that, couple of reasons, but one reason is that you should not be able to assume the content of encrypted material. Just because you see the same data being sent twice, you can start to assume what the kind of commands or whatever they contain so by using a different IV every single time, you're sort of removing that aspect as well. Uh, it's fine to run this without an IV, but that actually opens up a, a, an attack where a user could change your encrypted data, at least for the first block, that's 128 bits. So always use a, a, an IV and always make sure it's random. 128 bits you must uh, use because otherwise you get an error message. Uh, and, and don't reuse it. Uh, then, of course, it's your data that you're going to encrypt, so that's your message. Nothing strange with that. And again, you have a key that you're going to encrypt it with, and here we need to use our magic hat, uh, have a random key being uh, generated, and it should be 128 bits at the minimum. 256 bit is also uh, good to use, but 120 bit is good enough. So it really depends on, on, on your environment and what you could do. This produces something called a ciphertext, and that's really your encrypted data. Uh, and this is what you want to send to whoever's going to receive it, but you're also going to send the IV. Uh, so the IV is not sensitive, but it needs to be there when you decrypt. And normally you just stick that on the front of the ciphertext and send it off. And they'll do a reversed operation, then decrypt it on their side. So this is actually CBC uh, with AES uh, in sort of a basic level. If we look at AES GCM, it's slightly different. It takes four parameters. One of them is optional. The first one is called the nouns. Now, this is very similar to the IV, but it's, it's and it can be any size, but it's optimized for 96 bit. Uh, and it doesn't have to be random. It could be anything, it could be a counter, and so forth, but it just needs to be there. The problem is, although it's not sensitive, it should never ever be reused. 
You only used it once. It's, that's why it's called the nouns. Uh, you need to agree, if it's a counter, you probably need to agree on both sides what the counter is and how you count it up or you send the counter over or whatever. Easy is always to just use a random 96 bit uh, and send that over. If you start to reusing it, you're actually weakening your encryption after a while. So this is why you never reuse it. Second parameter, plain text, that's your data that's going to be encrypted. The key coming in as well. And then we have the fourth optional parameter. It's called associated data, the AD. And this is a very special parameter. Uh, it doesn't have to be there. It will work, work fine without it. And it's really any other data, something uh, doesn't, there's no defined that this is, has to be some particular kind of data. It's something that is associated with the data you're encrypting. Uh, and it, but it has to be there the next time you're going to decrypt if you're using it. So normally, let's say you're, uh, you are uh, encrypting profile images of a user. Then you could use the user ID as your associated data. And then whoever is going to decrypt is also going to have to have that data in order to be able to de and decrypt it. So it adds another sort of layer on top. This produces two things, actually. It, it produces ciphertext and a tag. And here's a little hint of what it did actually as well, because the tag was the signature that we spoke about before. So GCM actually has built-in integrity as well. So it's not only confidentiality. Uh, and you need to wrap this up into to, uh, a package that you send. And like the IV, you just stick the nouns in there and send it off and the tag comes at the end. So the difference between CBC and GCM is really that GCM has confidentiality and integrity. So now the common question is, why would you ever use CBC? Uh, and that, it's a good question, but it could be that you have no choice because you're working on an embedded device that only has certain uh, modes available or in some sort of cross-platform portability, CBC is probably the easier choice to choose because it will work everywhere. GCM is, isn't as widely adopted. Um, but if you have uh, GCM, use it because it will make your day a lot easier. So if we just revisit this scenario, uh, and now, of course, they want to add confidentiality as well. So we'll start off by Alice generating key and sending it to Bob. And then, now we're actually doing this over un unsecured communication channels. So that also means I have the key. So the scenario really stops here because whatever Alice is now encrypting, I have the key as well, so I can read it. So now we're going to have to solve that problem first before we actually can come back and start to encrypt things. So availability, as I said in the beginning, availability is very broad, but we're gonna, in this scenario, talk about uh, key sharing. So how we do we actually give someone else a key without compromising that key? Uh, and all these are sort of related to a very old problem because you cannot really have confidentiality without giving the key, but you kind of screwed up confidentiality when you gave someone the key if you didn't protect the key. So you're always going to come back to this problem over and over again. Uh, but we're going to introduce something called asymmetric encryption. And this is normally referred to public key encryption. Uh, and the difference here from symmetric encryption, which was the one that we looked at before, is that you have two keys. You have one public key, which is the green one here, and you have a private key, which is the red one. And this ha these have a mathematical relationship between them. Uh, and that mathematical relationship actually means that one of them can produce an operation that the other one can reverse. But not one of these keys can do both operations. So you would have a plain text of something you want to uh, encrypt. You use your public key to encrypt that, and you get your cipher text, which is the encrypted data, but then you need to use your private key in order to decrypt it. So it doesn't go the other way around. Or, uh, uh, and that means that you can take your public key, you can send it off however you like to anyone else, and they can take that public key, encrypt that data, send it to you, and you are the only one that can read it. And the public key is just that. It's not sensitive. It is a public key. 
You need to protect your private key though. There are two algorithms that are, are the most commonly used today. And that's the RSA, which is the old algorithm here, it was made up sometime during the 1970s. Uh, it was actually revolutionary because up until that point, symmetric key was the only option. You always have to share keys, but all of a sudden you have this mathematical algorithm that you can share keys in an insecure manner. Uh, elliptic curve is the youngster, is the new algorithm. Uh, it's, it's in a way, in some ways better than RSA, but they, they have the same, they have different strengths and weaknesses. They produce the same result, more or less. Different math though. Uh, elliptic curve is from the 1980s, so it's still fairly old. Uh, but it also means that these are tried and tested, we know they work, so they're a good choice to use. Um, they can be used for different things. They can use for, be used for encryption, they can be used for digital signatures, and they can be used for key agreement, and that's really what we're going to be looking at now. So, if we look at our scenario here, or more or less what do Alice and Bob need to do to share keys? I'm going to try to explain to you Diffie-Hellman, which is the actual algorithm used to share keys by using colors. Uh, and I, I have to admit that I stole this example a little bit from Wikipedia. There's an image there that kind of describes this using a similar way. Uh, but I think it's a very, very nice way to describe it. So let's assume that these two uh, gentlemen, they select a public color, yellow. They put it out there and say yellow is the color that we both have agreed on. We don't care if anyone else sees it, but it's yellow. Then what Alice would do is that he will uh, select a private color, red in this case, and mix those two. And that will produce another sort of orangey looking color. And then we'll put it out there in the public to see. This is my mixture. Still, ha he hasn't revealed that it was red he used. The assumption for all this is that it's very, very expensive to separate these colors into the colors that they were used, uh, to mi uh, used for mixing in the first place. Now Bob would do the same thing. So he'll select another color, which is his secret color, and we'll mix that yellow color and get another result. And he'll put it out there as well. So now there are three colors in the public domain, basically. And the final operation is that they'll switch these colors. So Alice will take Bob's mixture and vice versa and mix it with their private key. Or sorry, it is really their private key, but their private color. And they will end up with the same color on both sides. Now, yeah, sure, it will always be brown or some brown. But if we assume that there are so many different variations of brown or any co color in general, we're up at the math that this is using. They're using very large numbers uh, to do this. Um, so, so without actually any side knowing the other side's private color, they end up with the same result. And this is the beauty of Diffie-Hellman. Uh, and there are usually some sort of function in, in, in a platform, a library or whatever that, that can do this. Uh, they are referred to many different things. Key agreement is sort of the term, but it can be called key exchange or, or anything else towards that. They do take two parameters at the minimum. Uh, so you're going to have to start with, off by creating a public and private key pair on your side. So that's again, a random generated keys. Uh, either RSA or EC doesn't matter, it, it's, you use it similarly. And then the first parameter is really your private key. So this is done locally on, in your application. And then you get the public key from Bob here, so that he would do the same thing on his side. If you create the pu uh, private and public key pair, I'll send the public key to you, and you put that in, and that creates some shared data. And that shared data can be used directly, but normally you won't, because you're not guaranteed of the size and everything. But so, so you might need to do something else. So if we use this function called HKDF, which is hash-based message authentication code based extract and expand key derivation function. It's uh, fairly long, uh, so we'll stick with HKDF. Uh, this uses HMAC, as we saw before, inside, which is then turn, uh, uses uh, hashing algorithms. But what it does is stretches and, and, and makes uh, input data into a set length. So it takes four parameters. 
Uh, there are some different ideas of where the shared data goes in, but in my mind it goes into uh, a parameter called info. And info is supposed to be a context specific parameter. So it's, it's for what you're doing here now, you're putting that data in there. It could be something else, but I would uh, argue that the context here is that you're sharing this data. There is a salt as well, and we haven't mentioned salt, but salt is normally used to sort of ex expand your your uh, data that you're using to, to, if it's hashing or deriving things, uh, you might want to add more data to it, more entropy or more randomness to it or something, you can use salt for that. Salt are normally not sensitive, so you can send that off, and of course, the opposite side doing the same operation needs to have that same salt if it's used because it's optional. In our case, we probably have a fair uh, amount of random data here in this shared data, uh, share data from the randomness of these keys. Uh, so we're not going to use one. And of course, we need to tell it how much data we want. So I'm just saying here in this case, we, we want 64 bytes. And like HMAC, we need to provide which hashing algorithm we're going to use. So again, it's SHA-2 and SHA-3 are the easy choice. Uh, this produces that shared key. So if Bob is doing a similar operation on his side, he will get the exact same data coming out here. Now I said we're using 64 bytes. Uh, normally, maybe we only need 32 bytes to do encryption. That's 256 bits encryptions. We might even need less, but the nice thing with this is that if we ask for that and we split in two, we could have an encryption key and an integrity key if we need two. We only need to do one operation where we share a key uh, and then we get two usages out of it. But, but the size you decide for you if, uh, whatever your application requires. Uh, and then, of course, we need to remember to send the public key back to, to Bob so he can do the exact same operation and end up that, on the exact same result. So let's see what they're doing now then. So um, if both sides creates a public and private key pair here, then they share that uh, public key with each other, which run through some sort of key agreement uh, method, just like the one that we've seen they will produce the same key in both sides. So the only thing they shared is a public key, which by name is not sensitive. Then Alice here will send his message, encrypt it with the shared key. As you can see, it's encrypted, we can't read it. And it will arrive on Bob's side and he will use the same key that he derived to decrypt that message. And that means, of course, he can read the message. Uh, I wouldn't be able to go in here and change anything going down, uh, going on down here by the, uh, the exchange of messages. But there's still one problem in this image here though. And it is really coming back to that original sort of problem because the exchange of this public key here, there's no built-in integrity uh, to that. So that means that Alice and Bob needs to blindly trust that that public key is actually coming from each other. And if I were evil and go in here, I could actually change that and maybe introduce my own public key. And that is essentially what we call the man in the middle. Uh, so there is still a problem in here and we're not gonna have time to look at how we solve that, but the, the pieces are the same you might use HTTPS as one of the mitigations uh, to just protect this, this channel. Uh, you could use some other way of sharing keys, so you meet in person. Or if you're an app on a phone, then maybe you have a pre-bundled key in there in order to protect this. So there are many different ways of doing it. But there is a problem in this exchange. So key sizes, I'm going to mention a little bit about key sizes because it's quite interesting and just to give you an idea of the importance of them and importance of randomness. Uh, so if we have an assumption that we have a 256-bit key which has been randomly generated, but purely random, and uh, 
So there is no prediction of what that is. Then if we would go back in time a little bit, about 13.8 billion years. So we had this massive explosion then, which we normally refer to as the Big Bang. Uh, so essentially when the universe was born, if we start there and we move a little bit ahead, so about f uh, 4 million years, the star starts to uh, form in our universe. We move a little bit even further, about 8.5 billion years, our solar system was born. And then we move back to where we are today. So that's 13.8 billion years later of the Big Bang. And then why stop there? So we just move a little bit longer to 22 billion years from Big Bang, the sun starts to die. So it'll expand into this massive, big, uh, giant red star consuming most of the solar system and then shrink back into a little white dwarf and die off slowly. But, but no worries, it's not happening tomorrow, so it's still have time. Uh, you can, we can wa watch Netflix for, you don't have to worry to miss any of your episodes. Uh, but again, why, do we, why stop there? We just continue a little bit more. About 10 to the power of 15 years after Big Bang, the universe will die. So there's nothing else happening after this. Uh, but why stop there? So we continue a little bit more. So the, let's assume that this timeline just kind of continues off screen, going off for like forever, and there's another universe past and so forth. And all of a sudden you're standing there and you start to hear some voice somewhere. You know, and say, okay, you can't really make it out because it's so far away. And what they're saying really, and a little bit more time passes, and then all of a sudden you hear it. They found your key. So. I don't know about any of I Intel or uh, AMD if they have uh, any guarantees that their CPUs will actually last for this amount of time and a couple of universes more. But that's how long a, 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 a very big supercomputer that we have today will need in order to find your key, that the combination of your key if it's 256 bits. It's actually that 256 bits is, is a very big number. It's actually very close to the same number of uh, atoms that we have in the entire universe. So it's, it's 10, 10 to the power of 78, uh, huge number. And we have somewhere in between there and 10 to the power 82 or something atoms in the whole of the universe. So it's a massive, massive number. And that's really what it gives us the strength. We combine with randomness. So random is really the most important bit here. And I'm just coming to the end here. I put together a, a sheet, sheet, sheet that you can use. You get these slides afterwards. So just to sort of summarize everything. So it kind of tells you what kind of things there are today that you can use for different purposes. And here we also see that if you're using AES with CBC and add HMAC to it, you will have confidentiality and integrity. So if you don't have GCM available, you can do that instead. Uh, there are many other ways to do this, but this is just uh, a good way of doing it. It's been tried and tested and, uh, and used everywhere. Here's some minimum key sizes as well for different things, but the next slide also shows key sizes, and I'm not going to go through them. But this is, if you want a certain strength, this shows what kind of key size you need for different algorithms. Uh, so if you want to have the biggest strength here, 256 bits, gets past 2030, the year 2030, and are using the RSA public key encryption, you're having a number which is uh, 15,360 bit. That's 4,624 digits long number. So this is a little bit of a problem of RSA, is that the more strength, the bigger the keys become, and that's of course very intensive for computers to compute. So that's where elliptic curve is a little better, it has more keys. Uh, and then as a final thing here, here's 10 top uh, advice to use when you're using encryption in, uh, in development. I'm not going to go through them. The first one is the most important one. Use really secure random numbers. Because if you're not, in some senses, maybe you should just skip using encryption in the, start, uh, in the first place. Because randomness is the key here. Uh, and then number nine, 
you shouldn't forget about your users. Because the problem is, if you're making a very complex system, we're building lots of encryption and security mechanism and everything, and it's hard to use, they're going to find a way around it. And that way around is never going to be as secure. That could be post-it notes or whatever it is, but they'll, they'll just not use your security. Uh, and then, of course, it never hurts to ask someone about when you're designing this or write, writing this. You, you just have a second opinion. That could be your colleague that's sitting next to you. Just, do that, does this make sense? Uh, so it, ne never be afraid to ask for advice when you're, you're doing encryption because it's very easy to get it wrong. And getting it wrong means basically that you don't have the security of it. Uh, and that was really everything that I had today here. Uh, we are going to have a Q&A as well uh, at 7, seven o'clock, roughly. Yeah, yeah so at 7 o'clock we're going to have a Q&A. So for anyone uh, watching on YouTube and you have um, questions, ask them and we try to, or I try to answer them at 7 o'clock. And for all of you guys, there will be some pizza in between. So thank you. <laughs>